All right. Well, it's my pleasure to announce our main speaker for today. Um, I am not going to take up much time at all because he's going to do all the talking. Uh, he's doing a lot of great work uh, here in Houston trying to convince um, Congress types about some uh, sensible, reasonable uh, solutions to the climate say, change. So please help me in, uh, in welcoming uh, Peter Brin. All right, well, I don't know how I'm going to follow Maureen. I'll try to keep everybody awake. That was great. But uh, So thank you so much for having me. It's really exciting to be here. Um, I, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, before I jump into the talk, it's interesting. I, I get the opportunity to chat with all different types of groups, political groups and uh, faith groups and church groups and community groups, rotary clubs, things like that. Um, but it's seldom I'm in a place where I think it was about seventh grade when I found out what atheist meant, and I said, oh yeah, that's me, that, 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 that's what I am. And I've pretty much been that way ever since. I don't wear it on my sleeve too much, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's cool to be in a place. But one of the things I've always lamented is that, you know, the non-believer types generally don't have kind of a community, and that's what you all have created here, so I think it's really cool. Just found out about this group, but uh, it's really exciting. So let's see, is this on? No, there we go. All right, there we go. So, uh, as was mentioned, um, my name is uh, Peter Brin. I work, uh, my day job, I work with uh, ABB in marine electrification. That's basically Tesla for ships, you could think of it as. Um, and, but my volunteer role, I started the Houston chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby about six years ago, and I've done a lot of uh, volunteer roles with the group ever since. Um, and that's uh, what I'm here today to talk about. Um, when I was, uh, my previous role, I was with ExxonMobil for about eight years, and uh, interestingly enough, that's actually where I became the uh, supporter of the policy that we're going to talk about today. Uh, but before we do, I just, again, I want to thank you all, and I, I already kind of uh, talked a little bit about how I appreciate what you all are doing here, and I think it aligns well with what Citizens Climate Lobby does. We're a nonpartisan group. We try to build uh, relationships with our members of Congress and in our community to solve climate change. And uh, of course, you know, we, we base all of our, um, every, all the numbers and statistics I'm going to share with you today, of course, are based on uh, scientific uh, studies or economic analyses, things like that. So um, the foundation and reason and everything I'm, I'm very well aligned with. So it's nice to be here. So I want to just take a minute and kind of turn to you. And I'll just, again, I speak to all different groups with all different levels of uh, receptivity to the idea of climate change as a problem, and we've got to do something about it. Um, my suspicion is this group is probably largely on board, but maybe not. That's fine, too. I'm just curious. I'll just uh, pause for a second, and it's kind of your turn. I'm just kind of curious uh, either why do you care about climate change, or why don't you if you don't? And uh, what do you think we should do about it, and what do you want to learn about today? So anybody just want to call something out or raise a hand? or Yes, sir, in the back. Is that fresh water. Yeah, the, the impact on fresh water, great. Yeah, that's certainly, that's certainly an impact to keep an eye on. Yes, ma'am. Thanks for that. Yeah, in fact, uh, Hurricane Harvey, the, uh, NOAA just came out with new flood maps, and the city now is uh, in the process, or the county is in the process of updating some of the flood maps. Anything else? Maybe one more comment from? Yes, ma'am. And then we'll, actually, we'll take two. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Right, uh, environmental justice and the fact that uh, lower income folks tend to suffer the most and have the least means to deal with it, right? And final comment, Stephen? Great, thanks. Well, I, I, I will, uh, conf all right, I'll, t I'll take one more. Yes, sir. <laughs>
Yeah, we're, we're going to talk about that some today, about uh, talking climate change in a place like Houston in Texas, where uh, oil and gas has been such an important part of our economy for a long time and continues to be so today. And how do we look f into the future about that in a low carbon economy? So uh, a lot of what I'll talk about today is not sort of the doom and gloom and, 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 the, and the science behind climate change. There's plenty of that out there. And I would encourage you all, if you're not familiar with it, we'll talk a little bit about it. But uh, really, I want to talk more about solutions. It's actually going to be more of a policy discussion rather than a science discussion. Um, but having said that, because this is a science group, sometimes I, I don't always put this uh, chart up here. Um, in, in a lot of groups, I don't. But since this is a science-based group, I'll, I, I've decided to put it in. Um, the, basically, the takeaway is you know, the vast majority of the scientific community from all different uh, subject areas have sort of you know, aligned with the idea that, yeah, climate change is a problem. It's driven by greenhouse gas emissions. At least the climate change we're seeing today is. And, and it's a risk. Um, I think one of the, the things that I'll probably touch on real quick to actually to get to your point, sir, is why has this whole skepticism sort of evolved? Why, why is there so much pushback? I, I often say that if, if James Hansen 20 years ago when he came out and testified before Congress and talked about climate change, or 30 years ago now, um, if, he, if he said, yeah, climate change is a problem and the solution is everybody go home and have a bowl of ice cream, we would have solved this problem 30 years ago. Wouldn't have been a problem. Instead, the solution was, oh, you've got to stop driving your car, you've got to turn off your air conditioning, you've got to give up all the modern conveniences that you enjoy on your daily life. That's a hard message to sell to folks, right? 30 years ago, we couldn't envision what an economy that was a low-carbon economy looked like. We couldn't envision how do we get around, how do we fly places, how do we turn our lights on. Today, we're starting to see those solutions, and it makes it easier for folks to sort of start to envision that. What we're going to talk about today is a quicker way to get there. Um, but we'll, we'll talk, or we'll do a little bit of uh, talking about climate impacts just quickly to kind of put it in context. There's this thing called the Risky Business Report, which is pretty interesting. It was done by uh, Mike, uh, uh, well, it was, it was funded by folks like Mike Bloomberg, Hank Paulson, kind of some business leaders got together. And they said, what is the economic impact of climate change? What do we expect it to be? And so they put a team together to study it, and they did state-by-state -state reports or region-by-region -region reports. And for Texas, they found a couple of uh, pretty eye-opening statistics uh, in, in my mind, at least based on their analysis. Um, they came to the conclusion that today we have about 43 or so days that are above uh, 100 and, what's, oh, 95 degrees Fahrenheit. They expect that to more than double to over 106 days a year, so much longer summers, just what we need here in Houston. Um, <laughs> about 3,400 heat-related fatalities happen each day in Texas, or each, uh, not each day, <laughs> each year, <laughs> excuse me each year in Texas, and uh, that is expected to more than double to 7,900. Uh, decrease in corn yields, uh, so we're a big agriculture state, right? And um, now I think over the next 20 to 30 years, we're going to see a migration of agriculture north, but you can't go north forever until you, <laughs> you kind of run out of land eventually. So we do have to solve this problem. I think in the near term, it's manageable. In the long term, we have to solve this problem or we're gonna run out of places we can grow our food. Um, and this is a big, uh, big statistic, especially for folks in Galveston and, and along our coast, $30 billion worth of real estate exposed to basically that would be below mean high tide uh, by mid-century. This is already happening in Miami. You know, you see videos online, there's parts of Miami that experience what's called sunny day flooding. Just sunny day, beautiful day outside, and, and water's coming up to the sewers because the sea level's rising, uh, rising and, uh, and it's starting to flood parts of the city. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, this is sort of the global body that comes together every couple of years and, and studies and puts out reports and sort of tells us how we're doing, both on uh, the best science on what we can expect to have to plan for for climate change, but also how are we doing on reducing emissions or not. Um, and they came out with probably the most uh, clear statistic that I've seen in a while, that even, even for somebody who's been doing this for six years really caught my attention, it's their re recent finding was said, if we want to stay within the one and a half degree Celsius target, which is sort of the agreed upon target of that's where we would avoid the most severe impacts of climate change, it'd be manageable, it's gonna cost some money and cause some pain, but we can manage it. Uh, if we wanna keep that target, we need to cut our emissions in half in 12 years. It's a pretty stark statistic. Now, that's all the doom and gloom we're gonna do. We're gonna talk about solutions now. So the good news is we know how to solve this. We actually do, we know how to solve it. If we want fewer emissions, which is the goal, right? That's what's going to get us on the path. We have to make them more expensive. 
Any, are there any economists here? Good. Yeah, OK, we got <laughs> a few cautious hands and a, a couple of hands in the back. Um, I, every time I ask this question, because I don't want to put words in people's mouth, but I haven't heard anybody disagree, the fastest way, if you ask just about any economist, to do less of something is make it more expensive. People respond to price signals, right? When you go to the store, you always look it for a good deal. Everybody's always looking for a good deal. If we internalize the cost of emissions and put them on the product so that when I buy this clicker or when I buy that computer or my car or whatever, I'm looking for a good deal. And if we internalize the cost of emissions now, carbon emissions become part of that whole package. And now when I look for a good deal, I'm also looking for the thing with the lowest carbon emissions associated with it. So let's talk a little bit more about that. The good news is, how many of you knew that there is bipartisan uh, legislation in Congress right now, H.R. 763, that would put a price on carbon emissions? Oh, OK, we got a couple hands. H.R. <laughs> um, 763, the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, is the, sort of the manifestation of what CCL, Citizens Climate Lobby, has been working on for a long time, and a lot of other great groups that have started uh, more recently. Um, and it is a, an ongoing effort that we've had to sort of bring Congress together, Republicans and, and Democrats, and working on a solution uh, that's market-based, that is transparent, is predictable, is good for the economy, but also gets emissions down. And that's what, that's what I'm going to spend the bulk of the, the talk uh, talking about today. So how does, this, how does this policy work, and why, why did I jump in six years ago and I said, this is the right way to go, and I'm going to spend most of my time <laughs> focused on this, um, as I have for quite a while. So it's basically a four-legged stool. The first is a carbon fee. And I'll talk about what each one of these are in a minute. The second is a carbon dividend. The third is the carbon border adjustment. And the fourth is a limited regulatory adjustment. All right. I, I, I promise it'll be as interesting as Marina's music, but I'm, I'm going to work on it, OK? Try not to keep it too dry. <laughs> All right, so a carbon fee, what does that do? That gets back to what I said a minute ago. It internalizes the cost of, of CO2 emissions on the product. So what do we do? We basically put a fee on greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the, the mechanism that we, we, we apply it upstream to simplify it. So basically, we apply it at, at the wellhead for gas or oil, and we apply it basically just downstream of the mine for coal. But the idea is you apply that fee, and it trickles down throughout the economy. Now, we start that fee low, and we escalate it steadily, predictably, and transparently over time. So you put it today, and you know what that fee schedule is for the next 20 years. The benefit of that is, for anybody in business or finance, you know that the most important thing that you can have in business is predictability, right? So if you know what your market's going to be in five or 10 years, you're willing to make that investment. Finance opens up uh, a lot more dramatically once you have that certainty. That's the importance of the predictability here. And this is one of the reasons why you know, cap and trade can work as well. It's got its merits, the cap and trade, for those of you familiar with it. One of the challenges with cap and trade is it's a fluctuating price. The, one of the things that sold me on this is the predictability and the transparency of it. And there's really no way to game it. It's very simple. So there's a lot of good things to say about a carbon fee. What I just described is basically a carbon tax. Um, there's two big downsides to a carbon fee in and of itself. The first is that it raises a whole bunch of revenue. And the question is, where does that revenue go? Does the government keep it? Does it go into some program? What do you do with it? The second problem is that the people that are affected most significantly by this are low and middle income households. So how do we take all the good parts of the carbon fee but undo the bad parts? That's what leads us to the second aspect of this, which is a carbon dividend. So here's where we say all that money we just collected with the carbon fee, send it back to the American people. Send it back in the form of monthly dividend checks. Um, sounds, might sound kind of uh, novel or, or a little bit out there, but actually it's really not. If you look around in Alaska, they do this on an annual basis with their Alaska Permanent Fund. They send all the money from the oil royalties back to the citizens. Very, very popular program, not surprisingly. Uh, the Bush stimulus check, you remember years ago, we got a, a, a stimulus check from the government. Uh, every year, everybody gets their tax returns. And when these things happen, so the government knows how to do it, right? I mean, the government sends checks to people all the time, Social Security. Um, people sign up for direct deposit, things like that. So it's, it's not really that uh, remarkable an idea. It's just a novel way to deal with the revenue. And it also has a few interesting economic impacts I'll talk about in a minute. The third piece is the carbon border adjustment. Basically, the idea here is if we're putting a price on carbon emissions here at home, we're basically making the cost of input for our factories go up. 
So U.S. goods can maybe become competitively a little less attractive, right? A little more expensive. So to undo that, we want to sort of level the playing field. If you're competing with uh, uh, an Indian company that makes the same product, let's say I make these, these clipboards, right? And now my cost of input has gone up a little bit because I've invested to bring my emissions down to avoid that carbon fee. But now my cost, of, uh, my cost has gone up a little bit. My Indian competitor is going to undercut me. So the carbon border adjustment basically says if we're trading with a country that doesn't have a similar policy in place, you either put a, a tariff or a rebate, depending on which way the goods are going over the border, to balance that out. And that does two things. First, it levels the playing field again so that we're not just sending jobs and emissions overseas because we don't want to do that. Secondly, and more importantly, it now puts a cost incentive for those other countries to just follow suit and put their own carbon fee in place. Because if they do that, then they can avoid the tariff altogether. And that's really what the objective is. It's not to create a whole new tariff scheme. We don't want to really do that. It's really to incentivize other countries to just put their own price on carbon in place. Now, having said that, that argument is becoming less and less relevant because if you look at the top 10 economies in the world, we're one of only three that doesn't have a carbon price in place right now. It's us, Russia, and India. China is actually rolling out a cap and trade scheme themselves. Now, we could argue about the efficacy of that program and whether it be cheated or whatever, but <laughs> at least they're, they're taking the steps and making the uh, motions. And then the final, uh, the fourth plank of this is a limited regulatory adjustment. Now, what does this mean? This is sort of, I like to call this kind of the, 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 the trade-off for putting a carbon price in place. To get the business community comfortable with this idea, one of the things we say is, look, we're going to take some of the regulatory uncertainty that you have to deal with, we're going to take it off your plate. We're going to say that so long as we're meeting the targets on carbon em emissions reduction that you're seeking, the EPA will not be allowed to put any new carbon emission reduction plans in place. Now, this won't affect Clean Water Act, it won't affect Clean Air Act, or any of the things the EPA is doing today. It just says there won't be any new uh, emissions reductions uh, regulations that you'll have to deal with. And Based on the modeling, we really think it's gonna, that would be irrelevant anyway because we're going to go past the targets that we've seen on just about any other regulations anyway. So we think it's going to make it kind of unnecessary. Um, so that, that's the limited regulatory adjustment. It just says, and there is a revisit every, I think, 10 or, well, this is still up for negotiation, but the way the bill's written now is every 10 years you'd sort of go back and look and say, are we meeting our targets? And if we are, keep on trucking. If not, then the EPA would be uh, instructed to go ahead with some regulatory pushes and, and try to deal with it that way. So what do we think this policy will do, right? Uh, again, it's carbon fee, carbon dividend, um, the, uh, the border adjustment, and a regulatory adjustment. So what do we think it'll do? We think it'll be effective. We think it creates jobs, good for people, bipartisan, rev revenue neutral. So let's talk a little bit about all those things. Why do we think it's, why do we think it's so great? So we think it's effective because we've had modeling done. Um, there's this group called Regional Economic Modeling, Inc., and they do studies for state agencies. They do studies for, they've done studies for the gas industry. They work for all different organizations that want to study tax policy or economic policy and figure out what it's going to do to the economy. So we went to them. We commissioned them to do a study, <clears throat> and they came back and told us a lot of interesting stuff, and a lot of that is, is what uh, is the basis for some of the claims we're about to make. So they pretty much came back. Now, mind you, this also was a four-year-old study now. Uh, no, uh, yeah, a four- or five-year-old study. So some of the technology that they were modeling at that time it has been improved today. So it would probably be even better than this. But let's use these numbers for now. So their estimate was that we'd reduce emissions by about 40% within 12 years. This um, basically exceeds our Paris Accord commitments and really is not as dramatic as you think because it largely comes from moving from coal to gas, so it's actually good for our gas industry. It also comes from creating a huge industry in carbon sequestration. Now, what is that? That's when you burn gas, right? You power a power plant, and then you take those emissions, you pump them underground, and you store them underground indefinitely so they don't go into the atmosphere. What place in the world is better positioned in Houston, Texas, to benefit from a carbon sequestration industry? I think we'd have a huge industry that would open up here because you'd have every power plant in the country calling you up saying, I want to start sequestering my emissions so I don't have to pay this carbon fee anymore. It would create a huge industry for us in Texas. So anybody who says a carbon fee is bad for Houston is not understanding that aspect of it, not understanding the opportunity for gas as well. Now, I, I want to be clear. Our policy doesn't promote any particular energy source. We just expect that that was the most likely thing to happen 
Um, you also have a huge growth in wind power uh, and, and some, potentially some growth in nuclear as well. And of course, there's a lot of economists. There was actually a great um, Wall Street Journal uh, op-ed recently, kind of a, with a, thousands of economists across the country that signed on, uh, basically saying that they support a revenue-neutral carbon fee of some sort. Not necessarily our policy, but the, the concept. Uh, so this, this idea continues to grow support uh, in, in pretty prominent areas. It's good for people. Now, it's good for people for two main reasons based on our findings on the study. The first is that it improves health. Now, our policy is mostly focused on carbon dioxide emissions, CO2. That's the biggest greenhouse gas, right? CO2 does not directly harm your health, right? We're all breathing in and now it's fine. It doesn't hurt your health directly. It's a problem for greenhouse gas, but it's not a problem for your health. However, all the other stuff that comes out of the tailpipe and the exhaust stack at a refinery or a power plant or out of your car, there's other stuff in there, sulfur oxides, nitrous oxides, particulate matter, that hurts your health. That's the stuff that causes asthma and cancer and those types of things. So it's really a side benefit. But by reducing emission and by reducing those activities, we actually see uh, some reduction in human health um, problems due to pollution. The other reason it's good for people is that carbon dividend check. Remember that dividend check you're getting every month? We did a, a separate study, actually, um, based on census data. And it tried to look at the whole country and say, how would people fare under this policy? Right? Everybody's cost of living goes up a little bit because of the carbon fee but they're getting this money back. So what's the net balance? Well, we all have different carbon footprints, right? We're not all the same. Some of us have more carbon intense lifestyles. Some of us have less carbon intense lifestyles. Probably the biggest determining factor of that tends to be income. So what you find is that people in the low income brackets tend to have pretty low carbon footprints. That means that the vast majority, about 82%, if I remember correctly, of households in the lowest 40% of income either break even or come out ahead. So maybe their cost of living goes up 20 bucks a month, but they're getting this check for $50 a month. What does that do? That puts extra discretionary dollars in the pockets of people in the low income brackets. They go out and they spend those dollars because they don't have a lot of money sitting around. So they, you know, any additional dollar that comes in really helps those families out. Then it, and if you look at consumer spending patterns, they tend to spend those dollars in places like healthcare, retail, uh, going out to eat, putting an addition on the house, stuff like that. Those tend to create a lot of local jobs. And so what you see with stimulus spending is it does tend to help a lot of local communities because people spend those dollars locally. So there's a lot of growth in jobs and the economy. Yes, partly due to the clean energy transition, but also, believe it or not, more so, at least with this policy, due to all the other industries that benefit, like healthcare and retail, things like that. So it's actually a really interesting, this was a totally surprise consequence, by the, by the way, of this program. I did not expect that it would benefit the economy. I thought we would take a short-term hit, but long-term we'd fix climate change and all would be great. I didn't expect a short-term benefit. This was a big surprise to us and, and a really pleasant one. Um, creates jobs. You know, this gets back to the, kind of restating what I just said. It, due to the dividend helping families, uh, we generate hundreds of thousands of jobs. That's a relatively small percentage of the overall economy, but the point is we're not seriously hurting the economy. That's the important thing to keep in mind has bipartisan support. Uh, that is one thing that we have been laser focused on for years. We've had a lot of great members of Congress, Democrats who have wanted to introduce our policy for a long time. We've said, thank you for the support. Help, let's work together to find some Republican co-sponsors because this has to be bipartisan. We don't want it to be a, a partisan thing that gets pushed through and then it's debated for years and you know, when the next party gets in power, they just try to repeal it. We don't want that. We need something that's gonna stay in place. We need something that has bipartisan support. A, because it's the right thing to do, and B, because we don't want it to just get repealed. The good thing is a majority of Americans, based on polling, support something like this. Republicans, Democrats, independents alike. Um, Yale and uh, Utah uh, State and George Mason University all have worked together on different um, uh, polling. And they're kind of, we look at them as sort of the premier organization in America that does climate change uh, opinion uh, polling. And they consistently show, you know, you can ask the question in a number of different ways, but basically there's actually a lot of support, including on the Republican side, including amongst conservative Republicans for reducing emissions. Maybe they're not sure how to do it, but they see the value in it. And it's revenue neutral. I talked about that before. All the, emission, all the money goes back to the American people. 
Um, OK, so I've just said a lot. <laughs> I know I threw a lot at you. Um, and uh, there was a lot of detail in there. And so I'll just pause for a second. And I'm just kind of curious of anything I said or anything I didn't say is, uh, is interesting to you. So if it's all right on time, maybe we'll take like two minutes and do, well, I was gonna, we, can, we can either uh, say it out loud or I was actually going to encourage everybody maybe to break out into groups of like two. And just talk amongst yourselves maybe for like two minutes and just say what you did or didn't like about what I just said or any other, <laughs> any other thoughts you had. And then maybe after the talk, I'll be happy to chat with folks. So maybe just partner up with somebody next to you and maybe for like two minutes, we'll just I'll let you talk about it and share your thoughts. So we'll take a two minute break and let you all chat and then we'll come back. maybe 10 Democrats. Um, I know there are other Republicans waiting to sign on. I'm guessing what they're doing is they want to sign on in a block. Nobody wants to be the next one. I don't have that intel. I've asked our DC folks, I'm like, when am I going to get some more Republicans sign here? We need some balance. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a concern, but it's still a focus of ours. That is a goal of ours. All right, folks, let's, uh, let's bring it back. <laughs> um, I don't. Uh, I, I want to be respectful of the time I was given, so I'll, I'll wrap we up have, here and then. We have about ten minutes for Q and A if you'd like to. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I got. Let me just go a few more slides. I'll, I'll finish up okay. and then we'll. All right. Yeah, appreciate let me know when that. You're ready. So just real quick, sort of where we are on this policy. Um, we had it introduced for the first time ever in the last Congress, and uh, we just got it. It was reintroduced early this year in the 116th. So that's already happened. The next steps are we need companion legislation in the Senate. Uh, we need to move it through the committees get it through is what's called conference agreement between the House and the Senate, and then finally send it to the president's desk and seek a signature. So this guy is my new favorite guy in Congress. He's a Republican in Florida, our co-sponsor, our initial co-sponsor on this bill. Um, he's, uh, not, he's not somebody who you would say is what I'd call a weak Republican or a moderate Republican. He's a pretty conservative guy. But he's taken this up as a really important issue. This is really affecting Florida right now. And a lot of the Republican leadership we've seen uh, especially has been from places like Florida, but also places like Utah, uh, Northeast. We've, we've seen Republicans all over take action, so um, we're, I'm, I'm very encouraged by that. Uh, so real quick, who are we? I'll just close up with, with who we are. We're volunteer-driven. We have over 100,000 volunteers around, uh, well, all around the world, mostly in the U.S. and Canada. Over 500 local chapters in the U.S., and you know we work locally with our members of Congress in a positive way to advocate for years, we talked about this legislative proposal that we had. Now, as of uh, late last year, we actually had legislation, which was, uh, which was an amazing. <laughs> it took us a long time to get there, but it was amazing to actually have legislation on the floor. Um, we're uh, quickly, our values, we're focused. So we're very focused on, you know, we, we're not an organization against things. We're for things. So we stay very laser focused on this policy, not because there aren't a lot of other important things that have to happen on climate change, but just because 
we think to be effective and to get this done, we have to stay laser focused and we can't get sort of pulled into other activities. Um, we do everything built on relationships, so we try to build relationships in our community and with members of Congress. We are uh, very much focused on building relationships across the aisles, and, and as an organization, we're nonpartisan. Personal power, we sort of empower our volunteers to go do stuff they wouldn't otherwise do. We really, you know, our organization empowers the volunteers to own their region, to get out there, to work with their members of Congress and build those relationships. They don't dictate things from the national organization. They provide a lot of resources and organization and, and tools, but they don't dictate what we do. We believe in, you know, obviously uh, being forthright and open with folks and being as honest as we can. And optimism. Um, it takes eternal optimism to do this. <laughs> Many of us are cynics by nature. One of the things that CCL sort of helped me to come to realize is cynicism is basically giving up. Cynicism is saying, ah, oh, it's too hard. You can sound really smart and say, oh, Congress will never act. I'm smart. I know that. They're never going to act. When they do act, nobody ever comes back to the cynic and says, aha, you were wrong, right? Everybody's just focused on the next thing. You have to be an optimist and you have to be able to get up every morning and say, we got to solve this problem because if we don't, nobody, the cavalry is not coming. We are the cavalry. So you got to be eternally optimistic, even if it goes against the grain and, and it goes against your nature. And that's one of the things CCL has helped me to do personally. Um, so a few things. I, in the interest of time, yeah, we'll, we'll jump to questions. One thing I do have is if I can pass these around. One of the things we are asked by Congress all the time is, or are told by Congress all the time, is we don't hear enough from our constituents about this issue. So we want to make sure that we change that. So we're always collecting letters and encouraging people to make phone calls. So these are letters. If, um, if you are interested to fill one out today, that'd be great. And please return it to me. We like to hand deliver them to Congress. Also on the bottom is a little box. If you want to get involved with us, you can check and, and we'll send you an email after. So I'll just pass these clipboards around. and. Um, Please, uh, please take one, fill it out, and bring it back up to me before you leave today if you're interested. Um, if you're a community leader, we have, uh, what is a community leader? Community leader can be anything from you lead uh, an organization, like a, a political group. Um, I usually say faith leaders, but maybe not so many here today. Um, business leaders, if you, you know, own a business or something like that, or if you're a local politician, whatever, if you have some sort of stature in the community, we'd love to get your support. You can go here to energyinnovationact.org slash and or you can join us and I'll leave that number there and then I'll, we'll go to questions in the remaining time we have. So thank okay. you so much. We got about five minutes. We can probably get to a few questions. Would you be able to join us for lunch afterward to yeah, continue yeah, answering around. questions? Absolutely. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Here you go. Uh, when you mentioned uh, emission sequestration, um, you, talking about putting the gas back underground instead of having it floating in the air, um, how would that impact groundwater? That's a great question, and I am going to partially answer that. I'm not going to go too far out because I'm not a geologist, so I'm not going to pretend to know the, the true answer to that question. My basic understanding is you'd be basically pitting it in the same places that oil and gas exist today, right? So most oil and gas is under pressure when we first find it. And so these um, caverns already exist underground in many places. And in many places, we're sort of depressurizing it as we take oil and gas out. Now, if we're putting it back in, it's, it's very capable of holding that. And I, my understanding is generally these tend to be much deeper than where groundwater is. Now, of course, you have to get past it, so you have to have the integrity of, of a well to, to do that. But that's about the, I don't want to get too far out of my <laughs> realm of expertise on that. So, but it, you'll find plenty of uh, geologists in Houston who might be able to answer that question better than I can. Uh, so this gentleman in the back and then up front. So. <laughs> back here, okay. back table. Oh, okay. all right, we'll go there, and then, and then I'll come back to you. <laughs> yes, sir. Hold on. Coming with a functioning mic. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thanks. Sorry. Uh, good morning. Uh, my question was uh, just uh, what your thoughts have been around the effect of the uh, uh, equivalent regimes that have been put in place in Europe and in China that you would uh, mentioned. Let me see how quickly I can answer that. Um, <laughs> In Europe, the, the, there are a lot of policies that are out there. Um, many of them are more of a cap-and-trade type approach, um, which, which has its merits to it. The challenges with cap-and-trade, basically the idea of cap-and-trade is to say, we're going to set a cap on emissions, and then we're going to slowly you know, bring it down over time, and then let the market trade uh, credits to put those emissions out. That is a market-based approach. It has, it has uh, value to it. Two of the problems with the European uh, plan when it came out 
is that that cap is once you set that cap, um, the efficacy of a carbon s pricing system really depends on economic activity. Now, what do I mean by that? So what happened was when they set that cap, first of all, a lot of the industry in Germany and other places lobbied for much higher caps than they really needed. So it's very, uh, it's not very tight regulation to meet. And then also, the, that was right around the time of the economic, uh, the, the great uh, recession in 2008. So economic activity dropped, and all of a sudden you had all of these credits, and they were basically worthless. They were so cheap, it really didn't impact any activity for a long time until those levels came down. So one of the challenges with cap and trade is it's not responsive to the economy, whereas a, price, a simple price on carbon like this, whether the economy is booming or whether it's shrinking, that price on carbon is always there, and it's always predictable, it's always transparent. So the effectiveness of the European plan has been not that great because Europe has also done a lot of other regulatory pushes to reduce emissions. So those regulatory pushes and many times have kind of uh, gotten quicker to the, to the answer than the market mechanism that they put in place. So it hasn't been as effective as it could be there, from my understanding of it in Europe. Um, there's also policies, Reggie, in the Northeast, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, that's like kind of the Northeast. There's California has one that I think Quebec participates in. Uh, I, to be honest, I don't really don't know how well those policies have been in place. I do know that every time I've seen a cap and trade system, they've been made so enormously complex that it's mind boggling sometimes. And the thing I like about this is it took a while to go through it, but the concept's very simple. You just put a price on carbon and let the market do the rest. That's the appeal to me of a, of a carbon fee as an alternative. I will add one final thing, which is Canada is putting a system very much like this in place right now. Uh, I promise this guy right here, he'd be nice. Can, can you point him out to me, please? Sit I'll right here. Oh, okay, here you go. Uh, what do you think of uh, the Green New Deal, maybe in addition or instead of the carbon tax you're talking about? Yeah, uh, yeah, I hear a lot of about the Green New Deal. So the Green New Deal, I think, has done a couple of great things. One is that it has really pushed this inch issue into the limelight. I think it's pushed Congress on both sides of the aisle to talk about the issue. Um, I think... It's more of an aspiration than an actual policy, uh, the way it was written. So the Green New Deal sort of talks about a lot of uh, great lofty goals, but the intent, in my understanding, was to sort of signal a direction. And then all of the uh, respective committees in Congress, you know, the, the, the Energy Committee, the uh, Committee on, you know, Agriculture Committee, all these different committees that work on different issues would sort of use that as kind of, you know, okay, this is where we're trying to get, and then we're all going to work toward this goal. So the Green New Deal, I wouldn't say, is really an alternative to this. It's more of a, a guiding principle um, for conservatives who are very skeptical of that approach. This also offers a market-based alternative. So I think it's a, an appealing sort of bipartisan alternative to, to the Green New Deal, which has generally been sort of, there's been a lot of skepticism on the political right about that. Um, that's the, I'm, I'm sorry, that's the yeah, last one we last, have time okay. for, uh, but Peter, you're going to join us for lunch, be around, and he'll yeah. be around afterward if you'd like to pin him to the wall and ask him a question one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> uh, did, were you saying we have one more, or, or we're done? <laughs> we're done, okay. All right, well, thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it. Thanks.